My name is Daisha Clay. I'm the audio librarian here at Classical 91.7. While I'm a real librarian, I have a deep, dark secret. I know very little about classical music. I grew up listening to rock. And I know something about jazz. But when it comes to classical... But I really want to learn. So... Every week on this show, a classical music expert will give me a piece of classical music they think I should know, and then we'll discuss it. Come learn with me in the classical classroom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the classical classroom. I'm Daisha Clay, and today here with me all the way from literally the other side of the planet is Jeremy Eskenazi. Uh, he is a pianist who has a PhD in performance practice from the Royal Academy of Music. Uh, he gives concerts, seminars, workshops, and lecture recitals around the world. He's won many awards, including the Lillian Davies Beethoven Prize, and he is founder of the Muzio Clementi Society, which has created an authoritative online source of information about Clementi. It's a good segue. Uh, what are we going to be talking about today, Jeremy? Well, guess. <laughs> <laughs> Muzio <Happiness>. Clementi. <laughs> uh, Clementi. <laughs> awesome. Yes. He deserves a program all to himself, I believe. Well, why, why is that? Why do you think he deserves a program to himself? Well, he's he's a familiar name. If you've, if you've played a, a couple of years of piano, if you've learned a bit of piano, you will, or I'd say you'd have about an 80% chance of encountering the name Clementi um, because he wrote these um, beautiful little sonatinas for beginners. Mm -hmm. So he's a familiar name, if you like, amongst music lovers, but he's familiar for the wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> okay, explain. Well, um, I mean, these sonatinas are gorgeous, and, you know, it's amazing that they've been popular for over 200 years. Mm -hmm. To think they were published in 1797. Um, but Clementi um, actually wrote about 50 or 60 large scale sonatas in the Mozart and Beethoven style piano sonatas and that's that's what I believe he should be known for and at his the time of his death he was called um, after his death he was called the father of the piano yes I noticed I noticed that when I was I was poking around online looking up a couple of things that, that he was the father of the piano yes well that's it so um, how come we don't really know this nowadays I mean we as you said we can google it and find that in his gravestone which is at Westminster Abbey then, you know, it says there he, he's the father, called the father of the piano. But uh, really, why was this so? Uh, so he was basically at the forefront of piano development. So he was, I wouldn't say the only person who made the piano um, take off, uh, certainly not. But he was probably the biggest name associated with that that uh, new role that the piano was to take. That's certainly what he was known for at his time. Mm -hmm. So, um, And when was his time, by the way, and when did Clementi live? Yeah, well, the classical period. So he was born in 1752, which is uh, four years before Mozart. Mm -hmm. And he outlived Beethoven by five years, so he's, he died in 1832. Okay, okay. A long life, 80 years. And, and where did he live? So he was born in Rome, he's an Italian, but what's quite interesting about his uh, life is that at age 14, he was literally <laughs> trans or derooted, transplanted, <laughs> derooted um, from Rome to um, Dorset, England, Dorsetshire, which mm -hmm. is country England. Um, so in the late 18th century, it would have been a cultural desert, literally. And the reason he moved there at age 14 was because a British gentleman called Sir Peter Beckford um, heard Clementi play in Rome, the young Clementi, age 14, and decided that he would be the perfect entertainer for his guests uh, in his manor in Dorset. So he met Clementi's father and this, uh, had an agreement with him that um, Clementi should be his entertainer for the following seven years. Mm -hmm. So Clementi had this wonderful early exposure to music in Rome in his early teenage years and then suddenly nothing. Um, he was literally without a teacher, so he was self-taught from age 14. Oh, wow. 
Um, so he played the harpsichord there at uh, Sir Peter's m- Manor. He had uh, exposure to Peter's uh, musical library, which was quite substantial. But that was it, literally. So he was basically self-taught on the harpsichord. And then seven years later, he uh, decided to move to London. And London was the other extreme. It was basically the cultural center of Europe. And that's in the 1760s now, late 1760s. Um, so Clementi had a wonderful, um, wonderful early career there. And uh, he became very quickly known as one of the most prominent keyboard players because at the time keyboard encompassed harpsichord, uh, spinet, uh, a bit of clavichord, especially in Germany. Mm-hmm. But the piano as an instrument was, I mean, it existed, but it wasn't really taking off in the 1760s. Mm-hmm. Um, in <laughs> fact, <laughs> it was sort of, I mean, the, the harpsichord had been around for 200 years, you know, or more. Yeah. So 250 years. So they, they, they were really the dominant instrument and they, they were very well built and they were the sort of safe instrument to perform on. Whereas the piano, um, the piano had been invented around 1700 or so in, in, in Italy, mm-hmm. but it was very rudimentary and uh, it, it, it didn't project as well. It had flaws in its design. So it was very early days still, um, even though it had been around for several decades. So Clementi became known as a harpsichordist. But um, now I'm jumping several decades. <laughs> Um, in the 1760s and 1770s, the right place to be to have exposure to the latest piano development was actually Vienna. And guess who was at Vienna at the time? It was Mozart, of course. Oh. So, so if I move forward a decade, Clementi had played several pianos in England in the 1770s, but England wasn't the place for the piano. It was a bit rudimentary, as I said, in a sort of... But by 1781, which is when Clementi toured Europe and actually played in Vienna, mm-hmm. he met Mozart at a competition that was uh, set up by the emperor there, Joseph II. And Joseph II decided that this virtuoso that everyone knew about, called Clementi in Italian, ought to be heard in his palace. And he wanted stiff competition, so let's bring in the local star, Mozart. And they both played on the piano, mm-hmm. which was fairly new for Clementi, um, not so new for Mozart. So they, they improvised several things. Clementi played a piece that very much sounds like uh, Mozart's magic flute, except for the fact that Mozart's magic flute was written 10 years later. Oh, man. So... Yeah, <laughs> Mozart probably didn't mind that piece, <laughs> but he did mind the next piece that Clementi played, which uh, is now known as the Toccata Opus 11. Mm-hmm. So, it sounds elegant uh-huh. and quite beautiful, but um, check out the right hand. So it's going up and down the scale, but it's not one note at a time, it's two notes at a time. Can you hear the two notes in the right hand? Yeah, I hear it. Yeah, so it sounds feasible, but check out next time you're at a piano, try and go up and down the scales two notes at a time at that that speed. (laughs) It's pretty hard. (laughs) I can guarantee I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 hard. I mean, the pianist there is Simon Conning, a British pianist, a uh, very very good pianist, and he he does that work justice because he 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 just brings in that that grandeur, but also that expression to the piece. So for Mozart and Clementi, this was very much a um, a showpiece. Mm-hmm. Because you can't really, I mean, Mozart really couldn't play this kind of um, what we call double thirds, double notes, double uh-huh. thirds, double fourths. Ooh, so Clementi showed up Mozart. Oh, totally. 
Um, and <laughs> the in fact, was yeah, best. <laughs> <laughs> hard to believe. But um, the, the, when you read Mozart's letters after to his father after the event. You think, oh man, he was jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Is he like, so I went to this competition, Dad, and this jerk played yeah. this piece. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, initially, he says this charlatan, you know, no. um, and uh, I mean, he does admit that Clementi did play these uh, passages in thirds really well. Mm-hmm. But you know, once he's credited him for for that, he, he he decided to, you know, have a go at him for everything else and say, well, you know, he's he's no music musician. You know, he's he's just a mechanicus. You know, he's just uh, uh, someone who executes impressive things, but with no no soul. You know. Uh-huh. So Mozart decided to play a slow movement, and uh, he made a strong impression on Clementi as well. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, I think yeah. it was probably uh, a meeting that was going to have an enormous impact on Clementi as a composer and as a pianist, because uh, in the next few years he decided to almost say goodbye to that crazy virtuosity. Really? Mm. Why? He, yeah. Uh, almost in the space of a few years, well, no one really knows, but he probably thought, I've, I'm done with this, you know, I've, I've built my name around these, these things that no one can play, <laughs> just me, <laughs> and, uh, you know, how far, can I, <laughs> how far can I go with this, you know, uh, he's, he's, he's thought, okay, well, now I've got, to, I've got to get serious about music, you know, <laughs> um, and he, the wonderful thing is that he did. He deepened as a musician, and that's what I'm really personally excited at, is that he keeps a certain degree of high virtuosity, but it's not an impossible virtuosity. Like, it's, an, it's still accessible virtuosity, mm-hmm. but it's, it's a couple of notches up from Mozart, though. I thought you were going to say that, that he sort of gave that up because of some sort of conspiracy theory wherein Mozart took him down. So I'm glad to hear that that's not the case. <laughs> oh yeah, no, he, no one was familiar with uh, Mozart's letters, and um, they weren't published, and uh, that only happened in the early 19th century. Uh-huh. But funny enough, Mozart was long dead, but Clementi was still alive, and he mm-hmm. read these letters, and instead of saying, "Oh, what a you know, what an idiot" or something, he he actually he said, "Well, actually, Mozart was right. I was only concerned with virtuosity and just." showing off and oh. being the greatest you know and then i changed but I the reason okay. yeah but the reason he gave for that change his official reason for that change was that the english piano as we said earlier on wasn't good enough to accommodate that singing style that say mozart had you know that that wonderful grace and elegance and vocal lyrical intensity mm-hmm. So he blamed it on the pianos of his immediate environment, which I think is a pretty cheap excuse. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it, it certainly made sense because when you look at the old English pianos, they were really, really behind the German pianos. But what's quite interesting is that when Clementi came back from that continental tour in the early 1780s, then suddenly the English pianos were a lot more interesting than they used to be, but they also had a lot more potential than the German pianos. Okay. What are what were the differences between the the English and the German pianos? Well, and then and then like talk about like how how the the English pianos kind of evolved. Mm. Well, initially there weren't that many differences. So in the 1760s, you know, when Clementi was a teenager and so on, just that there weren't that many in England. They were mostly done in, in the, on the continent. But what happened is that in 1786, an Irishman called John Gabe, I think it's pronounced Gabe or Gibe, G-E-I-B, patented a, what's called a double action. So if I can just sort of step back a bit and look at the history of piano design very quickly, like in a nutshell, you know, uh-huh. you got 1700 piano the concept of the piano, you know, like the piano is invented basically by that Italian guy called Cristofori. Okay, then it doesn't take take off because the harpsichord had been around, blah, blah, blah. And the second most important stage is the improvement of the action. So the action is basically 
the mechanism, when you know, when you strike a key on the piano, there's a whole mechanism behind the key, and then there's some strings at the back of the piano. So um, the what happens is that when you strike a key, that lifts a hammer at the back of the key, and the hammer hits a string. Mm-hmm. So that second stage, improving that action, which is basically the whole mechanism between, you know, in between the key that you strike and the hammer that hits the string, that's what needed improving. And that's where that that Irishman John Gabe, Gabe in the seventeen late seventeen eighties invented that double action, which is instead of having the key that you strike immediately directly linked to that hammer that hits, hits the string, mm-hmm. the key that you strike is um, attached to an intermediate lever, mm-hmm. which then uh, sets the hammer off to hit the string. So it's like a more complicated, more sophisticated design. And you think, well, what's the point of that? Well, it actually increases the volume of the piano because if you hit the key and there's just a, a hammer at the back that hits the string well it's it's only ever going to go so loud um, oh, whereas if I you see. have a leverage system in the middle uh-huh. it propels the hammer and that just hits the string a lot faster I um, see it gives yeah. you more like torque more like yeah. power okay Got power it. so you yeah. can play louder but what's I have no incredi- idea what torque is by the way I just said that <laughs> word <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, just, it yeah, just, yeah, it sounded good. That's right. <laughs> yeah, it just goes bang, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and um, yes, but what's quite even more beautiful is that that intermediate lever also enables you to play softer. Yeah, because... Uh, okay, so it's yeah. just generally become like a more sensitive instrument. That's right. It's a more sensitive. It has huh. a more sensitive response. And that's a huge, like that's a milestone in piano development. So that all happened in England mm-hmm. because it was that Irishman who patented it. And Clementi was then interested in piano manufacture around that time and in the 1790s. Mm-hmm. And he also was a very famous teacher then in London and very expensive one. <laughs> so he gathered a lot of savings and decided to buy up uh, a company that's called Long- Longman and Broadrip, which was a publisher and instrument maker, which had gone bankrupt in 1795. Mm-hmm. Clementi then thought, right, I'll, I'll lift that company up and use the latest developments. And he used that. He was the first one to use that double action of John Gabe. And bingo. So Clementi pianos in the early 19th century became the most powerful, but also the most sensitive, the most technically advanced instruments in the whole of Europe. So the whole, wow. Yeah. Wow. So he literally changed the piano <laughs> like yep. like yeah he didn't just he didn't just write great music for piano he didn't just develop techniques he physically with with the use of this invention changed the actual piano yeah he did he certainly did um and where he wasn't the only one to do so there were other makers obviously as you can imagine and broadwood was the main one in england mm-hmm. he was the most advanced he was the cutting edge one and was taking the best of all the makers if you like but because he also was a great musician he just had all the industry around the piano if you like you know he had he had you know he was making the latest instrument he was also composing the late, you know, the, the music, the latest music, and you know, adapting, you know, his compositional and 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 pianistic style for that new instrument. That was a new thing, mm-hmm. and I'd, I'd love to play a movement that that really displays that that integration of virtuosity and um, and lyricism okay. that is very obvious in the 1790s in Clementi's music. Which, uh, um, which piece should we hear? Well, I thought I'd like to hear his sonata, Opus 34, number one, the third movement, which was published in 1795, and it's one of my favorite recordings there by, it's quite an old recording made in 1960, mm-hmm. live performance by the Russian pianist, great Russian pianist, Emil Gilels. Okay, let's hear it. Thank you. 
It's a rather innocent melody there. Mm -hmm. Quite folk like. And let's just um, say that this was 1795, so it was a year before Beethoven published his first piano sonatas. Wow. And um, I mean, there's a lot of Beethoven in there already. <laughs> Yeah, as you, you'll hear that soon. But this is very Clementi, that sort of melody and elegance and very Italian. Did Few Clementi know Beethoven? He did, yes. Okay. He actually published a lot of Beethoven's music. He was quite friendly with Beethoven, although that friendship was hardened. <laughs> um, Beethoven's brother wasn't so sure about Beethoven just selling his music you know, cheaply to Clementi, oh. but Beethoven admired Clementi, he really, because Clementi was 18 years older than Beethoven, so mm -hmm. he was a, almost a father figure. Now hear that, that's almost quite Beethoven, uh -huh. the octaves in the left hand. And is it the, the Beethoven that you're pointing out, like, is it that, that percussiveness? Yes, it's it's a sort yeah exactly that percussiveness that that um, that drama that the sort of big bold gestures. See, yeah. you hear that? Oh yeah, okay. That sort of grand style, you know, uh -huh. that could never be Mozart, that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yet it was Eat written. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was only written four years after Mozart's death. So yes, he, he did publish um, Beethoven's music in the early part of the 19th century mm -hmm. um, and um, he actually was, uh, for a while, Beethoven's only British publisher. Oh wow. That's how much Beethoven trusted him, um, although things didn't always go wrong, right and uh, some parcels that Beethoven sent never arrived, so Beethoven got a bit impatient and sought out some other publishers as well. Oh. Yeah. So, so the, the postal service soured their relationship. <laughs> well, admittedly, it was the middle of the war in Europe at that time, so Napoleon was virtually, um, you know, uh, forbidding things to, you know, circulate beyond certain borders and so on. So it was very hard. I think it had, you know, to to send something from Vienna to London, you had to go at that time via Russia, I think. And then back. I mean, it was, it was a very oh convoluted way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> but Beethoven got angry with Clementi anyway, mm. or, or well, dissatisfied with the, with yeah. just kind of how things went. Well, he, he did. He did. You know, Beethoven was a very irascible kind of uh, character, very impetuous. He, mm -hmm. he did have a go at Clementi in some letters that are now lost, but we, we know of them. Um, but what happened is that Clementi then came back to Vienna and they obviously made it up and um, ha had a meeting, had a nice lunch with the banker and uh, friendly, it was a friendly end to a sort of tumultuous <laughs> um, <laughs> relationship. <laughs> it sounds like he was a nice guy, Clementi. Like, like he... He reads Mozart's letters, and he's just like, "Yeah, he was right. I was being kind of a douche, you know." <laughs> like, yeah, and then, I think and, then and then he and then he makes up with Beethoven, even yeah. though he's clear like the man was being clearly, you know, he was just throwing a fit mm. and being <laughs> being irrational. And Clementi makes up with him and is like, "It's cool, man." Yeah, we're good. <laughs> yeah, I think he was, you know, a very open-minded man. But uh, his biographers and scholars, uh, and Clementi scholars, believe he was more a sort of pragmatic side. He was a very astute businessman, so he mm -hmm. didn't want to put a foot wrong with someone who he knew was a, a, an absolute, you know, world star. You know, Beethoven. Yeah. Uh, he, he could not put a foot wrong with him. So. And, and, you know, same with Mozart, because when the Mozart letters were published, Mozart was already known as, you know, that was 20 years after his death, <clears throat> mm. known as the greatest composer that ever lived. So, yeah, he, he obviously... Oh, I see. So it wouldn't have really, like, behooved him to say uh, Mozart was wrong. 
Yes. <laughs> or or that, Beethoven, you're a jerk because yeah, it no, would not have okay. So it wouldn't have come would, down very well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and also it's a practical thing. He was selling Beethoven's music, and he was actually selling a, his own arrangements of Mozart works too, so Mozart operas and Mozart symphonies, and these were selling well, as you can imagine, by mm. the 19th century. So, why, you know, why have a bad word for this if it's earning him money? You know, <laughs> <laughs> right? That would be so. Sort of but but I think like you that. Yeah, he was actually a very, I think he was a very nice man, very generous kind of personality. Um, well, do you think that's maybe why he's lesser known? And because because he was just a nice guy, and we all know nice guys finish last. Like, you know, he wasn't throwing fits, he wasn't dramatic, he was just kind of doing his thing. <laughs> well, I'm not. I don't know. I'm not sure because he he was kind of the wealthiest musician in Europe, <laughs> so <laughs> he wasn't exactly <laughs> behind okay. the line. You know? <laughs> I see. Okay. Um, he, he's he doing actually, fine. <laughs> yeah, he was he was doing pretty well. Uh, and in okay. fact, I think Mozart. Well, not not, not Mozart, but Beethoven certainly looked up to him because mm-hmm. he when he when he traveled to Europe, he stayed at basically Beethoven's publisher's house. So um, he had an amazing network um, across Europe and even as far as St. Petersburg in Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was like a big, you know, <laughs> CEO, if you like, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think maybe the reason he, was not, he sort of fell into oblivion very quickly, oh, there's probably many reasons, but I think being rich is probably not very good when you're in the romantic, when you're starting, the, you know, the early romantic uh, time you know uh, mm-hmm. it's better to be struggling and ah <laughs> uh, yeah yeah um, yeah he has like a sort of nice life story where he 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 you know he's self-taught he becomes a great businessman in addition to becoming a great performer he sort mm. of has an even keeled sounding life basically. yeah it, it all it all looks there's a lot of glitter you know and certainly yeah. during his lifetime he was sort of always praised and People probably got sick of always giving him the honors, and you know, mm-hmm. uh, okay, once he was passed away, well, Beethoven had already died, so let's focus on Beethoven, you know, and great music, and f- let's forget about Clementi. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Okay, so so he's he's created this business in building these pianos, and and did did people take to them immediately? Did 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 it? You know, did they sell like? Wildfire? They did. They did. He had a lot of commercial music that he sold very, very well. So, And that includes, of course, the infamous Sonatinas for Beginners, mm-hmm. <laughs> which are still selling very well. <laughs> um, so, yeah, but not just that. Also studies, etudes um, for the piano. And also he was into um, arranging folk tunes and uh, popular airs and all that stuff, and and also his chamber music output, which is basically accompanied sonatas, so sonatas with piano and either violin or violin and cello, or etc. Mm-hmm. Well, they're not as interesting musically as say Beethoven's or Mozart's or Haydn's. So it's basically just this solo output that is that's that stands out artistically. Mm-hmm. But another thing he sold really well is um, an, an anthology for piano organ, um, which is basically an amazing collection of about oh, it's 500 pages of uh, old music, ancient music, mm-hmm. which was a rare thing at the time, um, because as you probably know, in the early 19th century and certainly late 18th century, the um, focus was more on new music and just playing with the latest piece by the, you know, the, la- the latest fashionable con- composer. But uh, Clementi was also fascinated in br- digging out masterpieces from the past. And uh, one composer that he really, really brought out uh, more than anyone else was no less than Johann Sebastian Bach. Oh, wow. Who was virtually unknown other, outside Germany and Austria. So, really? Yes, yes. That is a crazy thought. Mm. <laughs> that he yeah. was unknown outside yeah. of his his sort of neighborhood. Amazing, yeah. But Clementi discovered Bach's music very early on, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, so literally brought 
Bach's well-tempered clavier to English and French audiences wow. and Russians probably. Yeah. Wow. He had such an impact mm. on classical music as we know it today. That's right. Yeah. That's Actually, Clementi crazy. was also a great symphonist. Mm -hmm. And um, he composed many symphonies, but uh, most of them are, have he decided to not publish them, unfortunately. And a lot of them have been lost. So it's been a painstaking process of reconstruction, restoration. But anyway, we have a recording of, of uh, these symphonies, the six in total. And one fantastic symphony, which I really love, is called The Great National. It's the third symphony. And uh, I suggest we listen to the second movement, which has a theme in it that uh, is very familiar to all of us. But the problem is... Well, not a problem. Clementi first presents it um, not from start to finish, but from finish to start. <laughs> Let's have a listen. <laughs> All right. And that's the theme, but it's in what they call cancrisons, which is back to front. It means walking backwards in Latin. Oh. So... Say, say the word again? Cancrisons. Okay. Later composers like Schoenberg used this technique widely and they called it retrograde. Huh. But in Clementi's time it was known as cancrisons. And there it is. I know that one. <laughs> you know why it's called the Great National one. <laughs> <laughs> it's all become so clear to me now. Wow. So, so Clementi wrote the music that eventually became the British National Anthem. He did. But ultimately became My Country Tis of Thee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you obviously feel very passionately about about his his life and his work. Yes. You started a whole society dedicated to to this guy. What what does the society do? How are you you're you're kind of uh, preaching the gospel of, of yeah. this guy who is clearly very good at doing that for other people. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. That's right, yeah. <laughs> so he deserves someone who do that, does that for him. And I'm not the only one, but certainly that society has been very good in that um, people just email me, um, you know, they want information about Clementi. And um, so I used to hold events when I was in England. Um, now it's mainly because I'm in Australia, it's a bit mm -hmm. more difficult to uh -huh. organize Clementi things, although they, they have been happening here as well. Well, Clementi is, is lucky to have you. <laughs> well, Jeremy Eskenazi, thank you so much for coming on and teaching me about this composer that I had before we started emailing. I'd literally never heard of. This was very cool to hear his story, and you um, you made great efforts to be on this show all the way from your TARDIS in Australia. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Leisha. It's been great. Um, all right, listeners, that about does it for this episode. For more Classroom, visit our website at houstonpublicmedia.org slash classroom. Uh, you'll find links to all of the ways to listen to us, including Stitcher and TuneIn. And ways to connect with us through social media are also there. Uh, you should connect with us in social media because we are hilarious. Uh, you can always send me a good old-fashioned email at dclay at houstonpublicmedia.org. Thanks today to audio producer Todd Tall Texan Holslander for his knob twiddling skills. Thanks to program director Sinjin Flynn for always noticing when I style my hair differently. Thanks to Jeremy Eskenazi for being here all the way from freaking Australia. Thanks to me for saying words. But most of all, thanks to you for listening. We'll catch you next time. Bye.